Okay, uh, welcome everybody. I think it's about time. Uh, so you've been following the lecture, so I don't think I need to introduce the speakers. I mean, by reciting their biographies, right? We know who they are. Uh, and this session, Mr. Ivan Askew is going to talk about the whistleblower behind the National Security Agency surveillance revelation. Basically, for those of you who were at the opening ceremony, you would have learned that uh, Mr. Askew, he has 40 years of journalistic experience. He was one of the Guardian journalists who flew to Hong Kong uh, in 2013 and met at West Hilton. So, judging from the, I mean, what he has told us about the war, it's going to describe to you what Snowden is, is it, as a person, right? So, without further ado, let's welcome Mr. Sarasky. Today I'm just going to speak about Snowden and uh, meet, meeting Snowden. Okay. The, the, this isn't a proper PowerPoint presentation, it's just pictures of Snowden and the journalists <laughs> and, uh, and, and they come at sort of random points and uh, I can't even remember exactly what's on it so uh, don't, don't be, I'll just click on them occasionally just as a backdrop. Um, Stoughton uh, came to Hong Kong in May uh, last year. Uh, he was, he's a spy. He worked for America's National Security Agency. He was a computer specialist. And he was ha unhappy of what he saw inside the NSA, and he decided to leak uh, this information uh, in tens of thousands of top secret documents. So in May last year, he flew to Hong Kong, and uh, he checked into an expensive hotel in uh, Hong Kong. He was there for a day or two, Decided that it was too expensive and moved to the Mira Hotel where he stayed for the next three weeks. Now, he took a huge gamble in coming to Hong Kong because he came here to meet journalists and hand this information uh, over to reporters. But he couldn't be sure when he came to Hong Kong that the journalists would come from America to meet him. He'd been in touch with uh, Laura Poitras, an American journalist uh, based in Berlin, and Glenn Greenwald, an American journalist in Rio de Janeiro, and uh, a Washington Post reporter called Bart Gelman, who was based in Washington. Now, Bart Gelman, after a week-long discussion with the Washington Post lawyers, decided that it wasn't safe to come to Hong Kong. He was worried because your Snowden was a spy, maybe a traitor, and that he was going to meet, meet him in what the Washington Post lawyers described as Red China. They thought that 
China is a communist country, and here's an American spy handing over information. So they, that government decided, that government actually took a car to the airport and was about to fly to Hong Kong when he decided that it wasn't sensible. So uh, the Washington Post decided not to go, uh, but myself and Blake Greenwald and Lord Petraeus uh, flew from New York to Hong Kong to meet uh, Snowden. So to repeat, uh, Snowden took a chance. He didn't, he'd never met a journalist in his life, he had no contact with the media. So he flew to Hong Kong and hoped that a journalist would come. The chances are, maybe no journalist would have gone and the NSA police would have found them and taken them back to America and the story would never have been told. Um, he took uh, another gamble in coming to Hong Kong. He, he could have gone anywhere in the world. He could have gone to Iceland, which is a tradition of protecting um, uh, people involved in sort of pushing for internet freedom. Uh, Iceland parliamentarians are sympathetic to people like WikiLeaks. But, uh, so he came to Hong Kong because he thought that Hong Kong had a strong independent judicial system. And he thought that Hong Kong had a long tradition of freedom of speech. And as I say, he could have gone to Iceland, he could have gone to Ecuador or Venezuela, but he chose Hong Kong. Um, so he took two gambles. One, that he hoped the journalists would turn up. And two, he hoped that by coming to Hong Kong, that he would have a safe haven, that he would have protection here when the American government came after him. Now, as a consequence of this meeting with Snowden, and at the time I thought it was just another assignment, and it's turned into a huge story. It's a consequence, the consequences for um, the intelligence agencies. Uh, the Americans and British say it's caused them enormous damage, that the stone revelations have destroyed up to 30% of their uh, data gathering capability um, and their ability to track terrorists, and pedophiles and international criminal gangs has been made much more difficult uh, because of the stone revelations. Uh, there's, there's been, as a result, another consequence is a, as a result of the, the Snowden revelations, there's been this worldwide debate on the privacy uh, being national security, you know, where the balance should be. Um, in some parts of the world, like America and Germany, uh, Australia, Indonesia, Brazil, there's a huge debate. In other places, like Britain, there's less of a debate. Uh, in Hong Kong and China, I'm not sure how, what the impact of Snowden has been. In China, I imagine next to none. Uh, um, the week after the Snowden revelations, there was a demonstration in support of Snowden in Hong Kong, but they only attracted a few hundred people. So I'm not sure if Snowden is a big issue in Hong Kong or not. Um, other issues. Uh, people have raised questions about Google and Facebook and Microsoft because Snowden revealed that all these organizations are handing over your personal data to the intelligence agencies. And that loss of trust in Facebook and Google, Microsoft, Skype has cost them billions of dollars and they're changing their systems. They're starting to introduce encrypted uh, email and encrypted chat uh, to try and restore uh, public trust. There's freedom of speech issues, freedom of the press. Uh, my newspaper, The Guardian, has been under, uh, has been harassed by the British government, been threatened with legal action. Uh, the partner of one of my colleagues uh, was held at Heathrow Airport, David Miranda. They came into the Guardian building and destroyed the Guardian computers. And uh, there's a consequence to for Edward Stone. Uh, when he took, when he came to Hong Kong. Uh, he thought that he would fight U.S. extradition, but probably eventually he would lose that extradition battle and return to the uh, U.S. probably 
end up in jail for the rest of his life. Um, as most of you probably are aware, Snowden fled Hong Kong and is now in Moscow. Uh, he doesn't want to be there, he'd much rather be in Western Europe. Uh, he'd much rather be, uh, instead of Western Europe, he'd much rather be back home in the US uh, as a free man. Okay, I'm going to start at the beginning. The, uh, this wasn't my story. Uh, Snowden contacted, wanted to contact Len Greenwald. I'll just run through these. Uh, so we wanted to debate about Snowden. Is, is he a hero or is he a traitor? And we'll talk about this in the course of the next half hour. You can make up your own mind. Um, now, this is Laura Poitras, the uh, American journalist and filmmaker who's based in Berlin. She lives in Berlin. She made a documentary about Iraq, and she made a documentary about Osama bin Laden's uh, bodyguard and driver. Um, now, both of these are sensitive in America, and she felt that she, she's no longer safe in America. Um, Whenever she was traveling back to America, she was stopped 37 times at the airport and interrogated and uh, held, held up for hours at a time. She had her cameras, uh, tele um, her notebooks, uh, laptops uh, confiscated. So she decided to move to Berlin where she thought she would have more freedom. Um, this is Glenn Greenwald. Now this is who Snowden wanted, uh, the, the journalist he most wanted to speak to, because Glenn lives in Rio uh, de Janeiro, and from there he's been writing about national security. And Snowden liked his writing. So he tried to get in touch with Glenn and sent him messages uh, saying, look, I've got some private information that's very sensitive and I need to speak to you. The Glenn is like me, he's not technical, he's totally hopeless uh, in terms of uh, laptops and security. And Snowden said to him, I'm going to send you information and you'll need to set up encrypted chat that will be a safe form of communications. I'm going to say, he, Snowden even sent Glenn a video showing him how to install this software. And Glenn being Glenn, ignored him. A, because he didn't know how to do it, uh, but B, he wasn't sure who the person was that was suggesting this. But he contacted uh, Laura Poitras, and she's the heroine of this story. And she took uh, Stone seriously. From her flat in Berlin, uh, she started to communicate with uh, Stone. Stone at this time was in Hawaii, uh, working for the as a contractor for the NSA. Uh, Laura, did have, Laura is technical, and she did have the software, and they started this um, encrypted chat. This is an example of the way that ES, Edward Snowden, uh, are you there? Laura Petraeus, yes, are you okay? And this, we kept this dialogue going. Uh, The uh, Glenn and Laura uh, went to New York. They saw the Guardian's US editor, Janine Gibson, and she said, just go to New York, uh, take you and with you, and the three of us flew to Hong Kong. And uh, we went, initially, Stoughton had been in chat with uh, Laura and said, uh, I'll meet you at the Mira Hotel on the Monday. And, uh, this is all a bit cloak and dagger. He said to them, I'll meet you in the Mira Hotel beside the crocodile. I didn't know this, I've still not seen this crocodile. I've been to the Mira Hotel lots of times, but I've still not, apparently there's a crocodile, a stuffed crocodile next to a restroom. So he told them, I'll see you uh, beside the crocodile, and I'll be carrying a, a Rubik's Cube uh, do you know what that is? Uh, like, so he, they went to the Mira Hotel and they stood by the crocodile 
the stone didn't turn off. But they had a backup plan. He said to finish, if I'm not there at the rearranged time, come back. And uh, so when they went back the second time, the saw with the Rubik Cube, went up to his hotel room in the mirror and uh, did the interview. The, uh, the next day, I went with uh, Glenn and Laura and we interviewed uh, Stone. And at the time, we didn't know whether, uh, sorry, this is Vanity Fair. Uh, and they did an article about this and made it look like a movie poster. So that's Glenn and Laura and myself. And that's Bart Gelman, the reporter who didn't go to Hong Kong uh, from the Washington Post. And uh, this was a uh, stone at the Mira Hotel. Now, we, we didn't know whether he was real or not. And uh, when you see Snowden there, uh, he was 29 at the time. And we, we, we expected somebody who was my age, you know, somebody old and disgruntled and unhappy with his career, uh, that had been in the NSA for too long and was fed up and being passed over. And we weren't expecting somebody as young as Stoughton. Although he's 29 there, but he looks much younger. He looks more like your age. <laughs> and, and then when he described his life, I mean, at the time I was saying, is this guy for real? Because newspapers have been fooled before. And the Sunday Times was famously published what they thought were the diaries of Adolf Hitler. Uh, and the documents looked real, but they were completely fake. Uh, and you know, as journalists, you will come across it time and time again, people who will tell you the most ridiculous stories. Sometimes they turn out to be true, and sometimes they're complete rubbish. Uh, so we are looking at this guy and thinking, is he for real? And he's told us his story. He left school at 16. He uh, trained with the US Special Forces because he wanted to fight in Iraq. He broke both his legs uh, during the training. Uh, he worked for the CIA in Geneva. He uh, worked for the NSA in Japan. Uh, he worked for the NSA back in America and uh, on the American mainland. And then he transferred to Hawaii. So we looked at this guy and thought, I mean, you look about 21 or 22 and you're trained with the US Special Forces and you've been working all around the world. It, it seemed preposterous. But eventually he persuaded us uh, because he produced the documents uh, and because he knew that we needed to pers be persuaded. So he brought with him a suitcase full of ID. He gave us his driving license, his passport, his social security number, which is a big deal in America. Um, he gave us uh, his CIA uh, ID, uh, you know, a whole host of information. And the documents themselves uh, seem real. Uh, so we, and sometimes you just follow your instinct. I, I liked Edward Snowden and I trusted him. And uh, as a result of that, we, uh, I thought, yeah, this guy's for real. But we never knew for sure until we did the very first story, uh, which was uh, about the bulk collection of uh, telephone, uh, of phone calls. And uh, we said, we told the White House that we we're going to run this story and we we're going to use the, this document. So the White House could have said, look, this document's not real. But when the White House confirmed that yes, the document was real, then we knew that Snowden, or any final doubts we had uh, were gone. Um, this was me and Glenn in the Mira Hotel interviewing uh, Snowden. We interviewed him over uh, eight days, partly to establish that he was real, partly to talk about his background, to do a profile, and partly to try and understand the documents. 
that uh, he'd given us. Uh, in the Mira Hotel, he was totally paranoid. He kept thinking the CIA were going to knock, you know, knock down the door and uh, uh, arrest or snatch him and probably blame myself and Laura as well. And he said that if it wasn't the CIA, it would be the Hong Kong police. Uh, maybe the Americans would tip off the police and say, uh, will you arrest this guy for us? But he thought the CIA, uh, whose station is in Kowloon, not far from the Mira Hotel, he thought they might hire uh, triads, criminal gangs, to come and uh, uh, take us. Uh, he said this. Um, and he was totally paranoid throughout, cause he, because and each day that we went to see him, we thought, he won't be there, he'll be gone. Uh, they'll have found him. Um, but the very first time I met him, and I, I said this at the opening, I said, I'd like to take, take uh, this conversation. And he didn't have a problem with taping a conversation. He had a problem with me using the iPhone. <laughs> Because uh, he said that this is like a listening device. The NSA can listen in. And even if I take the bat even if I switch it off or take the battery out, the NSA can listen to the conversation. So he was absolutely appalled that I'd even brought it into the room and uh, insisted that I put it in the fridge. And he wasn't content with it just being in the fridge. He wanted it in the freezer compartment of the fridge. Because he, he thought that that was the only place that would completely make it possible to listen in on. He, um, in this hotel room, he put pillows up the side of the door and along the bottom of the door in case there was somebody in the hall listening in. Uh, when he was logging onto his computer, he put a red hood over his head and over the laptop so people couldn't see him put his passwords into his laptop. He, he, he was scared that maybe there was a camera outside, which would have been difficult because it's Kowloon Park and the camera would need to have been suspended to about a thousand feet in the air. And, or he, he was scared there might be a camera planted in the hotel room that he couldn't see. So he put the red hood, which he always used as part of his, uh, he brought it with him to Hong Kong. Uh, he put the red hood over his laptop. And um, an example of his, how paranoid and how nervous we all were, a fire alarm went off while we were interviewing him. And Snowden wasn't sure if the fire alarm was for real or whether it was an attempt by the CIA to, to get us to leave the room and get down to the lobby or out into the street. So all the time we're debating, is it a fire and should we be leaving? Or is it the CIA? Or is it just a false alarm, just a test of the alarm? It mean, it sounds absurd now, uh, but at the time we were all, uh, we did sort of 10 minutes sort of debating whether to leave the hotel room or not. So what did they reveal? There's tens of thousands of documents. He showed that, contrary to what the American government has said, there was a bulk collection of the phone calls and emails of American citizens. Uh, there's a bulk collection of uh, that same electronic data of citizens uh, all around the world. Uh, the NSA alone collects uh, 20 billion uh, phone calls and emails every day. Uh, so, you know, for everyone in this room, uh, your emails, uh, your phone calls, uh, at least, uh, uh, you know, if you use bank, anything, they can find out information about you in five minutes flat. They can establish all the details of your life very quickly if they want to. And they established, he showed us, for the first time, and I wasn't aware of it, that 
organizations like Facebook and uh, Google and Microsoft and Skype uh, and uh, you know, a host of other organizations and the, telecom, the big telecom companies like Verizon and AT&T uh, hand over uh, data to uh, the intelligence agencies. These companies say they have to do it under the law, but uh, the extent to which they were doing it, I certainly didn't know before. Uh, they revealed that it's not, it doesn't surprise me that the NSA targets uh, uh, Chinese organizations like the People's Liberation Army. Uh, a bit more surprised that they target Chinese universities. Um, but what we were surprised is that uh, the Americans even target countries that are friendly, like Germany, uh, listening into the mobile of the Chancellor Angela Merkel, or the Australians listening into the phone calls of the uh, Indonesian president, his wife, uh, his advisor, uh, you know, his family. Um, Uh, among the documents, uh, one that was famous was PRISM, uh, and that's the one that revealed the relationship between the intelligence agencies and uh, Facebook and uh, Yahoo, and uh, I, I'll just run through them quickly. This is what the documents look like. They were very technical, but you can see listed there the organizations involved. They were handing over data to the intelligence services. Microsoft, Google, Yahoo, Facebook, Paltop, YouTube, Skype, AOL, and Apple. So if you're using any of those, your private data is not private. <laughs> um, and again, this is another one, one of the documents. And we were given tens of thousands of these. Um, so the Guardian, we, the first story we published was uh, about Verizon and the phone calls. The second was PRISM, and this was the front page of the Guardian on that day. Um, now Snowden, uh, unusual for a source, uh, didn't want to remain anonymous. Somebody's getting jumpy in the back. <laughs> You're getting paranoid too. <laughs> the, I mean, most sources want to remain anonymous, and we would have, we, we wanted Snowden to be anonymous because we thought we don't want you to end up in jail. But he said from the start that he wanted to go public, um, and there's lots of reasons for this. Uh, he didn't want his colleagues at the NSA to be subjected to the ordeal of uh, a leak inquiry, um, but he, he also thought that the story, the documents would have more uh, authority, would have more force if he went public. And the third thing is that we couldn't have protected this anonymity anyway. Uh, before we published the first story, the NSA were already looking for him. He'd been missing from his office for more than two weeks. And he said he'd, he'd taken He'd, he'd gone on holiday for two weeks because he said he needed some medical treatment. But after two weeks, when he failed to come back, the uh, NSA became anxious. Uh, and when we were interviewing him in the Mira Hotel, the NSA police went to his home in Hawaii and interviewed his girlfriend, Lindsay Mills, and said, uh, you know, where is Snowden? Uh, so he decided, uh, you know, they would have they could look at his flight records, they could look at his credit card, and they could have established within minutes that he was staying at the Mira Hotel. He's not a very good spy. Um, he was, uh, you know, he would never use a credit card in a hotel. He was staying in the Mira Hotel under his own name. Uh, uh, even myself and Glenn, uh, we were staying at a different hotel and we were under anonymous uh, names, so. Um, they would have found him very easily. The, uh, so Laura did a 12 minute video and we published it and uh, Stone says, my name is Edward Stone and I'm the whistleblower. And the next day, myself and Glenn was staying at the W, uh, journalists from Hong Kong and all around the world descended in Hong Kong and they thought because we are staying at the W 
the stone that was also at the W. And the, the lobby, we came down in the morning, and it was just a wash uh, with media from all around the world. And the hotel manager came to us and said, I'd like the boat to leave. <laughs> and it was basically because uh, of all the chaos that we created. Um, he said that the rooms for that night were all booked. Um, but I think he just felt, um, you know, the other guests, it wasn't fair to the other guests at the hotel. So he arranged for myself and Glenn to uh, be smuggled out through a back lift to a car outside and we went to another hotel. Um, the, the journalists in Hong Kong were really smart. They were trying to work out where Snowden was staying. So they looked at the picture of Snowden in the uh, that was taken in the Mira Hotel. And they crowdsourced the picture and said, can anybody identify this hotel? And then uh, very quickly, someone got in touch with uh, uh, the journalist and says, yes, I recognize that. That's the uh, Mira Hotel. I always thought it was because of the lamp fitting. But there's a journalist in Denmark that has been investigating this and says it wasn't the lamp fitting. It was uh, something else. Uh, maybe the shape of the bed or whatever. Uh, but they, they, they identified it. And Snowden was in the Mirror Hotel, and he got a call from the Wall Street Journal saying, are you Edward Snowden? Is, he, is this his room? And Snowden says, no. <laughs> and he put the phone down and thought, it's time to leave. And he left the Mirror. He, um, he, he, he tried to disguise his appearance. He, he, he back combed his hair and he shaved his beard and uh, he got a green, a green umbrella, not a yellow one, a green one. <laughs> and he put the umbrella down over his head to see if it would disguise the top part of his face. It, it looked pathetic. <laughs> um, he's, a, he's a terrible spy. <laughs> and he left and he went to, initially I think he went to a UN building. And uh, then he uh, went underground for two weeks. He was staying with uh, some benefactor in Hong Kong, some private individual whose identity we still don't know. And it was arranged by two lawyers. The Guardian found two lawyers for him. And uh, uh, Robert Thibault and Jonathan Mann, two Hong Kong-based uh, human rights lawyers. And, uh, they were acting on his behalf. Uh, this was myself, Glenn, and uh, Laura. Uh, I, we went from the W to the Sheraton Hotel, and this was our Glenn's last night in Hong Kong. Um, well, when Snowden wanted to stay in Hong Kong and fight extradition, uh, so he thought the best thing would be to try and get uh, the people of Hong Kong on his side. So he thought of, he would give an interview to the South China Morning Post, and that would maybe try and get uh, public opinion on his side. Uh, Lana Lam um, of the Post uh, was contacted by Snowden and came to our hotel she didn't meet Snowden face to face, but at this point he was underground. And uh, she did the interview through encrypted chat and got this exclusive uh, with Snowden. And uh, again, he revealed that uh, the NSA were targeting uh, universities and other locations, not only in uh, mainland China, but in Hong Kong. Uh, Skip all that. This was a picture of the uh, Guardian destroying the computers on which the uh, stories were written. They had to be, uh, they wanted the, the computer reduced just to tiny fragments. Uh, so 
a guardian editor who spent uh, three hours in the guardian basement uh, reducing the uh, computers to rubble. And this is in the land of uh, freedom, free press and free speech. Uh, this is David Miranda, Glenn Greenwell's partner, who was held at uh, Heathrow Airport uh, for nine hours, uh, accused of terrorism. And this is the final point, and then I will um, hand over for uh, questions. A lot, a lot of people are depressed about journalism, journalism so especially in Britain and America, and uh, I think here too, uh, newspapers are uh, in decline. Uh, my own paper, The Guardian, uh, we publish a paper in Britain. It won't exist in five or ten years' time. In fact, it might not even exist next week. It, it's, um, we're losing something like 10 to 15 percent of our readership each year. But I'm not depressed about it, and no one else in the Guardian is depressed about it either. Because, uh, sorry, is this, uh, is this me? Because we've moved over digitally. Uh, the Guardian is available, it's free online. We have something like 200,000 people buy the Guardian uh, each day in Britain. So maybe we've got 400,000 people reading the paper, which is small. Uh, and the profit from the paper is gradually being reduced. But we've got something like 100 million people online. Uh, and now digitally, you can tell the story better in a combination of video and uh, interactive features, maps, graphics. Uh, the story, uh, and you can respond, you have the interaction with uh, readers. Uh, if I make a mistake in a story, a reader will come back in 30 seconds and tell me I've made a mistake and I can correct it. Or they can, they can come back and comment and say, I think your story is rubbish, you're biased, uh, you're untruthful. And that's good too. I mean, that's what democracy means. And now this is an example. We did lots of stories about Snowden from the documents. Uh, so we decided it would be a good idea to pull the whole lot together. And uh, we did this thing called NSA Decoded. It was mainly the work, not, I wrote the works, but it was mainly the work of um, a colleague of mine, Gabe Dance, he's an American. And uh, he's head of interactive. And he came up with this really smart idea of we interviewed people at the, from the NSA, uh, members of the US Congress, um, whistleblowers, and the, we put the interviews embedded into the copy. So as you scroll down, um, you as you scroll down, you can see uh, the uh, people. The people start speaking as you scroll down, and uh, this was a sort of a, you know, sort of revolutionary way of presenting a story. It also has very good graphics and maps. And what happened was that um, if, if I wrote 4,000 words for the paper, or I did 4,000 words uh, for the internet in a sort of normal digital way, uh, most young people wouldn't read it. But they did read this because it was presented uh, in this uh, fashion. And people under the age of 21 were reading it for 15 uh, to 18 minutes, which is very unusual. So uh, for me, this isn't a bad thing to be a journalist. I, uh, I think it's, although it may seem as if opportunities in journalism are declining, um, I think it's a great time, there's great opportunities. Anybody can blog, uh, anybody can uh, write, if you're good enough, uh, you can have an audience. Um, and as for Snowden, I mean, this is, really, this is all about Snowden. Uh, yeah, I won a Pulitzer, Glenn and Laura won a Pulitzer Prize, um, uh, and we've 
received other prizes and the Guardian's done well out of this. But Edward Snowden, there's been books about, the, this is a Guardian book about Snowden, this is Glenn's book. Uh, uh, Laura Poitras has just done a documentary, it will be in Hong Kong soon, uh, it's called Citizen Four, which was, that was his uh, label when he contacted Laura. The things I'm descri I described today in the Mira Hotel, the Red Hood and the fire alarm, and, uh, these are all uh, shown in Citizen Four, uh, so you can see for yourself. Uh, this is us, we received the award, the Polk Award. So we've done well up it. Um, I saw Snowden in Moscow in July, and this is the editor of The Guardian, Alan Rusbridger. Um, he's, he's a courageous editor. He's been under pressure from the establishment for the last 20 years for one story or another, but he just keeps doing them. So we've won awards and we've done well out of it, uh, but Edward Snowden is still stuck in Moscow. Uh, and for me, that's unfinished business. I mean, this story isn't finished for me till uh, Snowden is either living in Switzerland or Norway or, uh, you know, hopefully back in the US as a free man. So that's me, and I'll take questions. Very interesting, uh, I think, this question of the whole story. I mean, how uh, it's not in the middle of paranoia. I think it's very interesting. So, any questions? Okay, you, you got a question, right? Um, can you just shout? We have passing the mic. Thank you for sharing this extraordinary experience with us. Um, so, I have a question about the Russian Guardian. Uh, what is your opinion on the He didn't come to the Guardian. And he wouldn't have cared less whether it was the Guardian or the South China Morning Post. He wouldn't have cared whether it was the Guardian or El Globo in Brazil. And um, he wanted, he chose Glenn Greenwald. Uh, it was Glenn Greenwald he wanted to give the story to. So Glenn Greenwald was working for the Guardian at that time as a columnist. So it was lucky for the Guardian that uh, <laughs> Glenn was on the staff. And when Glenn uh, failed to re respond to his emails, he got in touch with Laura. And uh, Laura tried to get in touch with Glenn as well, and Glenn didn't initially respond. So she got in touch with Bart Gelman of the Post, because Bart, like Glenn, writes about national security. He's a very good reporter. He's been writing about this for years. He won a Pulitzer already for his reporting of national security. Um, but as I said, when Laura went to the post and uh, saw Bart Gelman, they were nervous about coming to Hong Kong. So uh, finally she got in touch with Glenn, and uh, Glenn, because he was in The Guardian, The Guardian said, yes, we want to do this story, we want to check it out. Um, but it was never, he never came to the garden, he came to Glen. And then what's interesting, and again it answers your question to some extent, um, you know, for, because the NSA is so powerful and the British equivalent, uh, the GCHQ, I mean, these are powerful organizations. And it was very difficult just for the Guardian alone uh, to take this on. Um, Laura had given some of the documents to the Post, uh, so Mark Gelman had some, or Snowden had given them to Mark Gelman. So when we started publishing, the Post started publishing as well. And then Glenn and Laura, because they didn't feel any 
great loyalty to the Guardian. Laura was because she was in Berlin, she started uh, cooperating with, with Der Spiegel. And then Glenn started cooperating with um, uh, El Globo in Brazil. And then, because the Guardian came under pressure, you saw them, they destroyed our computers. Uh, we teamed up with uh, the New York Times, and we put the documents into the New York Times building. They gave us a special room that was secure, and we put the documents there. So we walked in New York with the New York Times and ProPublica. And then in Australia, the Guardian teamed up with uh, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. So it became a huge, you know, journalists of the world unite, you know, solidarity. Uh, and the second part of your question, I think the Guardian, Alan Rosbridger, Ben Bradley, the legendary Washington Post editor, died last week. I think Alan Rodsbridger is the sort of Ben Bradley of this generation. He's taken on the you know, politicians, the police, uh, big international companies, Rupert Murdoch's empire, uh, did WikiLeaks. Uh, WikiLeaks came to us, uh, uh, and now Snowden. Uh, and he's got, so he's got lots of experience. And although I came to Hong Kong, he quickly threw the whole weight of the Guardian behind this story. You know, lots of specialist reporters. He set up teams in London, uh, teams in New York. Uh, some of, I'm not techie. Some of my, one of my colleagues, James Ball, is 27, uh, former press officer at WikiLeaks. He knows how to, his way around computers. Uh, so guys like that, he built, he established these teams. He, he got columnists writing about it. He got uh, various specialists involved. He got newspapers from around the world engaged in this story. Uh, so I think The Guardian uh, did it better than most organizations. And also we were here to um, create this international uh, movement of journalists. Uh, but if, if he'd gone to the BBC, I don't think the BBC would have done this story. Uh, if he'd gone to the New York Times, uh, they would probably have done it as well. As the Guardian. I just, I just read your article about uh, Snowden. That he predicts the government will launch an investigation to see he had broken the Espionage Act. Does that hint that Snowden defined himself as a spy? But just from your observation, that he sees himself a spy or he want to be a hero. Well, let, let me ask you, who thinks he's a whistleblower and who thinks he's a spy? Who thinks he's a whistleblower? And who thinks he's a traitor? And Snowden uh, has been, he was anticipating, I mean, Snowden is a spy. I mean, he worked for the CIA. And then the NSA is a surveillance spy organization. So he is a spy. Um, he's been, he was only predicting what he thought would happen. Um, he has been charged under the Espionage Act. He faces three charges. Each carries 10 years in jail. So he's looking at 30, 30 years in jail if he goes back to America. Uh, but that's not, that's only the initial charges. He's been charged uh, as of now. If, if he goes back to America, he will face more charges. Uh, he's looking at a lifetime in jail. Uh, these charges are, for the Americans, this is much more serious than WikiLeaks and the Julian Assange. What he's done is much, the classification of these documents is much higher. So he, he's looking at life in jail. Uh, the Espionage Act uh, carries the death sentence. Uh, the, um, the US Attorney General, uh, when they were discussing with Hong Kong, and Hong Kong said they wouldn't return him uh, to America because he faced the death penalty. Uh, the Attorney General said that Snowden wouldn't face the death penalty. Okay. Another question? So, 
So actually, I have three questions before I just get a chance to answer. Okay. And my first question is how to feel the mutual trust during the interview with Soda. And my second question is if I quote it correctly, you said that yesterday the strongest impact brought by the story is that most whistleblowers remain anonymous, but Soda choose to be in the public. So my question is, in terms of the people's right to know and national security, what else can journalists do in this social issue? So are we just waiting for another student to come out or we could make some attempts or at least do something for the public and the whistleblower? And my third question is, if this event happened again, will things be different or remain the same? Especially in journalism. Okay. Yeah, good. So we've heard the questions as well. And the, the Laura Poitras didn't want me to go to Hong Kong. Uh, she thought they'd agreed with Snowden that uh, only herself and Glenn uh, would go. So the initial trust. I had to establish a rapport with um, not only with Snowden but with Laura. And when I went to the hotel room and met him for the first time, uh, he was suspicious of me. He thought I was a company man. I was a uh, guardian uh, man sent to Bethlehem. Uh, but when I interviewed him over something like two to three hours to establish that he was who he was. He warmed to me. He thought this guy's professional and uh, we established trust. And the same thing happened with Laura. She thought this guy is behaving like a reporter should. And uh, I mean, now myself and Laura are friends. Myself and Snowden are friends. Um, the, I, I think when we did WikiLeaks, I thought. Well, that's it. We'll never, we'll never have a story like this ever again. You know, I've kind of access to all these State Department documents. Uh, and then along comes Snowden. There's an even bigger story. There's going to be a lot more whistleblowers coming because of the, because of the electronic revolution. But Snowden can download something like 200,000 uh, documents and stick them in a couple of memory sticks. Uh, the number of people in the US with um, security clearance is something from 800,000 to 5 million. I've seen both figures. But say, let's be conservative and say it's 800,000 people. That's 800,000 potential whistleblowers. Um, I, I wish whistleblowers would come forward from China or from Russia. Uh, I'd like to know about Vladimir Putin's money, I'd like to know more about what's happening inside China. I hope they'll wipe it away.